We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Steve St. Angelo of the SRS Rocco Report. Thanks for joining me today, Steve. Well, hey, Tom, it's great to be here. A lot of interesting things happening in the market, so it's always great to talk to you. Absolutely. It's, again, being a broken record, there's never never a lack of interesting things to talk about. But today, Steve and I are going to focus on kind of walking through, let's say, the economics of Bitcoin mining. You recently put together a big report and a bunch of research really trying to understand what the economics of this industry are, what the lifespan of a lot of this hardware is, and how economic this really ends up being at the end of the day. Yeah, and I don't pretend to be an expert on all facets of Bitcoin. There's a lot, a lot of intelligent people, but I, I like to keep it simple, stupid. I look at the gold mining industry the same way as I look at the Bitcoin mining industry, the silver mining industry. And so when you look at some of this information, Tom, it's quite shocking because I don't think a lot of people who invest in either the Bitcoin miners or the Bitcoin Bitcoin itself understand what is happening with the Bitcoin mining industry. And I don't think it's sustainable. So you have a bunch of charts that you're going to walk us through here. And really, this kind of starts with the there's two main big Bitcoin miners that you're looking at the, the economics of, right? Yeah, uh, two of the largest are in the United States, uh, Marathon and uh, Riot Platforms. There are others, but it used to be years ago that China was the, the largest uh, Bitcoin manufacturer, but it takes so much energy, China decided to crack down on it. And so a lot of it moved to the United States. And as of, uh, I think it was 2022, the United States had 38% of all the hash rate. So you, you figure about 38%. Now it's it's about that 40%. So we're we're the largest producers and they're public companies. So you get to understand what's happening when you look at the public data, when you look at the SEC filings. Mm -hmm. So Steve, is there not a place for Bitcoin miners to be able to utilize the excess power at non-peak hours from the grid, and that can help actually stabilize the grid. You know, I've heard that argument made, and that seems to, you know, make sense to me. But what is your take on that? There is some of that going on. You, you, you hear like it's called stranded energy, especially in the United States. They've got natural gas that uh, it's coming out of, uh, let's say, oil wells in the Permian, and. They don't want to, they don't, they, they can't really, it's not economic to take some of this, this gas and to put it through the pipeline. And so what Bitcoin mining companies are doing are taking some of this energy and they're capturing it, but that's not sustainable. Right? We're going to get into trouble with U.S. Uh, shale gas and they, we're going to need all of it. So even though they're doing some stranded, they're doing interesting things to use gas or energy that may be wasted, that's going to become less uh, uh, there's going to be less of that energy supply in the future. So yes, it's good to use energy that's being wasted, but I think in the future, as I talk about the energy cliff and energy scarcity, we're going to need more than energy. And according to the U.S. Energy, Admin energy Information Agency, the Bitcoin miners are consuming almost between one and a half, two percent of the United States electricity. So this is a lot of electricity that is used to make uh, digital Bitcoins on a ledger. Mm -hmm. So Steve, a lot of this is also focused on, you know, basically the hardware and yes. the depreciation. So I think that's a, a good place to kind of start maybe jumping into the charts here and understand how these Bitcoin miners depreciate over time, how their performance works and what that end result ends up being because of the efficiency or the ability of those miners to keep up with the new generations of hardware. Yeah. And Tom, when I talk about depreciation, when you hear about depreciation, it's not just a tax write-off. Mm -hmm. It represents the destruction of the capital. It's something, if it's either a, a, a mining equipment, 
it's a refrigerator, it's a, a, a office, that thing is going to depreciate over time. And so it's actually, it's losing value. So this is what depreciation means. It's destruction of the asset itself uh, of the capital. So I guess I'll, I'll share a screen now. This is, uh, this is, again, this is my analysis. I'm not saying I'm 100%. I, I know everything about the Bitcoin mining industry, but I call it the Bitcoin mining industry is a Ponzi scheme. And it's a Ponzi scheme due to the Bitcoin mining. They're using shareholders to, to fund CapEx. So I call it the Red Queen Syndrome because the more having, there's a lot more miners are needed to continue producing Bitcoin. So I think there's big problems with the top Bitcoin mining companies because they're underreporting depreciation costs. And so I, I found out about this. I kind of understood that Bitcoin miners, they're about a five year. That's how long they lasted. But I knew it was maybe closer to four. What I didn't know, and Paul Butler gets credit for this, he put an article back in 2022, said the problem with Bitcoin miners is Bitcoin miners burn enormous amount of capital just to capture the same slice of a diminishing pie, but they take advantage of investor confusion over how Bitcoin mining works to frame it as investing in growth. So when you look at typically taxes or products, assets, equipment, it's a straight line depreciation. And this is five years going from 2017 to 2022. What Paul Butler is saying, using blockchain, and he, he goes through all these different Bitcoin mining companies, and this is the actual depreciation of a typical Bitcoin miner. It's the red line. It's not straight line. So it loses most of the value or it produces most of the Bitcoin in the first year or two. So by the second year, it's produced about 90% of the Bitcoin on average. So it, it basically in two years, that Bitcoin miner is 90% defunct mm -hmm. and it's got a little bit more the third year. So if we look, we know this because Riot Platform reported it in its SEC filings. This is property and equipment. And if you look at Riot Platform in their 2023 annual report, you're going to see miners in the mining equipment two years. So they're being truthful. That's a 90% depreciation by second year. They're basically writing off that Bitcoin miner in two years. So uh, I'm using a little bit more conservative. Instead of 80%, I'm going 75% first year, 90% by the second year. And that Bitcoin miner is toast by the third year. This, again, this is kind of a generalization. Now, we can see this, Tom, taking place because... What this chart is showing is Riot Platform's Bitcoin mining fleet. It's in the, in the red line. You can see right here in the red line, the number of Bitcoin miners. And then in the bars, I show how many Bitcoins were produced each month. Now, Riot says during the summer, they do what they call, uh, they get power credits because they, we, they, in the summer, there's a lot of air conditioning in Texas. So they cut back on their production. So it, it could be a, a little bit higher in the summer months, but regardless, what you'll notice, in January 23, they had 82,656 Bitcoin miners produced 740 Bitcoins. It, it increased, but you could see as it flat, as it increased again in, in September, October, November, we had a bit more of the Bitcoin production, but then as it remained flat, what do you see happen from December to April? 375 Bitcoin miner, uh, Bitcoins were produced in April 2024. If you go back to January, a little more than a year ago, it was double the amount of Bitcoins that were produced with 30,000 less Bitcoin miners. This is the depreciation, the destruction of Bitcoin miners right in front of your face. Now, what is interesting, I noticed in the last report on April 24th, they, they usually tell you how many Bitcoin miners they have in their fleet, how many Bitcoins they produced. They stopped reporting how many Bitcoin miners. So I contacted the, the IR department and they said, well, we're getting uh, new miners in our new facility. So we're just going to you know, show the hash rate. Well, this is deceiving because I think they're trying to hide 
the depreciation, the massive depreciation in these Bitcoin miners. So let me move to Marathon. Marathon. Can I interrupt you for a sec? It, sure. You know, when the difficulty level goes up or the, I believe the halvening is the same thing there. Is that part of that dynamic that can go into play there in April? We have to remember the having hap- the having took place on April 20th. Mm-hmm. So there was about a, a, a maybe 10 days. So it's going to be interesting. You know, it's going to be interesting to see what the, because they're supposed to get half the amount of Bitcoins produced per block now. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the difficulty drop. So I'm looking forward to seeing, I think we're going to see a, a pretty substantial decline in the amount of Bitcoins that were produced in May. Mm-hmm. So this but is all what basically this- consistent data with consistent difficulty level rather than you know an artifact of the new level of difficulty it takes to mine those new blocks correct and i'll you'll see in the next two charts so but you know marathon has a lot more miners marathon digital they had 71,000 in january 2023 it's more than tripled mm-hmm. almost a quarter a million But what you notice, they did increase their Bitcoin production. They had a spike in December. But look, in April, it's 850. But it was also 825 back in March, almost a year ago, with less than half the Bitcoin miners. So again, this is the depreciation showing showing us that they're producing less and less Bitcoin due to the Bitcoin miners are just running. They're running out. Uh, this depreciation, the destruction of the Bitcoin miner is taking place right in front of our eyes. And I just want to note that, unfortunately, Marathon did not produce the data for August, September, October for the miners. I I just calculated and estimated that. But this puts it all together, Tom. The red is the Bitcoin mining number in the background. Mm -hmm. What I'm showing is how many Bitcoins were produced per thousand Bitcoin miners for Riot Platform. In January, it was nine Bitcoins were produced per thousand Bitcoin miners. And what do you see happening? It was falling, and now we, it got back up to 5.5. And even if we forget April, let's forget April because they did have some of the having at the end of April, 3.8 per 1,000 Bitcoin miners. So it's almost a third of what it was in January. So this is, and we see the same thing. We see the same thing for Marathon. Marathon produced 9.7 Bitcoins per thousand miners in January. And in March, it was 3.8. April, it's 3.5. So this is less to do with the difficulty or the having. It's more to do with the inherent nature of a Bitcoin miner that produces roughly 75% of the Bitcoins first year and then about 90% second year, that doesn't really change. Uh, and that's, it's kind of like a shale oil well. It loses about 70% of its, it, its oil in the, or 50, 60% in the first year. It's very similar. And it seems as if they designed the Bitcoin proof of work this way. So Steve, what do you think we can kind of chalk that up to? Is that as you're kind of alluding to is that this planned obsolescence idea is that the degradation of the hardware what do you think causes this depreciation in the amount of bitcoin that this hardware is able to produce well if the bitcoin miners are producing at a constant hash rate according to the data that uh that was put out is that they produce about 75% of that of all the bitcoins they're ever going to produce in the first year Mm -hmm. that is the way it's kind of designed and by the second year 85 90 percent and the third year 95 100 percent they could get you could get more but it's it becomes it becomes not only obsolescent the the bitcoin miner is, is using a lot of power and it's it's actually burning through the Bitcoin miner. It, it's its functionality is is be, being destroyed, and that's why we need new computers. We need new cell phones. Even the data centers that are have millions of servers. These 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 servers last three four years. You've got to replace them. Mm-hmm. So it's nothing new. Bitcoin does it on a much 
rapid scale. So what we need to understand, and this is where it gets into the cost, because a lot of people say, well, you know, Steve, you're wrong. It costs half. It, it doesn't cost that much to produce Bitcoin. They're only looking at the electricity and the cost. They're not considering this massive depreciation and the capital expenditure that it takes to purchase and continue to replace these Bitcoin miners. So this is Riot Platform's estimated Bitcoin mining depreciation. Now, as of December, it was 496 million. I'm just going by that number. If one year, if according to about 75% depreciation, it's going to write off 372 million in just the first year, 74 million in, in the next, and 50 million in the last year. This is approximations. Now, remember I told you that uh, Riot said it was two years? Well, guess what? They've changed it. The it says right here, depreciation and amortization for three months ending 2024 was 32.3 million down from 59.3 million last year. What they've done, the decrease was due to the change in our lives of the Bitcoin miners from two to three. They've decided for technical reasons, I'm not going to get into it, that they're going to add another year to their Bitcoin miners. So they've lowered their depreciation. Well, that, that, that means they're lowering their cost. So Marathon, because Marathon has double the amount of Bitcoin miners that Riot does, their, the value of their Bitcoin miners is $862 million, million. Look at my estimated depreciation for first year of these Bitcoin miners. It's $646 million, then one twenty nine, then eighty seven. But they show three years. But what Marathon is doing is 33% one year, 33% next year. 33% last year. This does this is not true. So by underreporting depreciation and I'll show you in this next chart. Well, I'll get to that. By underreporting depreciation, they're underreporting the costs. So I was to say, fund, how do they end up like fueling that capital expenditure to replace those miners? Right here. They destroyed the shareholders. See, if you're investing in, in Marathon and Riot in 20 and 21, you're making a lot of money because they went up. I'll show you charts. But in order to fund capital, to expand production and to buy Bitcoin miners, it wasn't profitable enough. So they had to issue shares. And here we see in January 2020, Marathon had 8.5 million. Now they've got 268. Riot was 25 million. Now it's 289. And if we look at the amount of dollars, Raya has issued 2.4 billion since 2020. They issued another 340, they issued another 353 million in the first quarter. So what's funny, Tom, their market cap is 2.8 billion. They issued 2.4 billion of capital to fund business over this period. And Marathon issued 1.8. So Riot issued almost 86% of its market cap in, in stock issuance. So this, the reason why they had to do this, Tom, because banks are not going to lend companies that suffer a 90% depreciation in two years of capital destruction. They're just not going to do it. So they had to go to their shareholders and they kind of had to mislead shareholders of the growth. They're going to go into growth. And unfortunately, that hasn't been the case. One more thing, and if you have any more questions, I believe that they're also kind of uh, the, comp the stock based compensation has been very nice for management and employees. It's 400 million between these two companies. That's about 10% of the stock dilution. So this is, I mean, look how much uh, it just the first quarter 51 million in stock compensation. So, it's a, these mining companies are a wonderful way to destroy shareholder value and reward management and employees. Uh, that's what I see so far. You know, we've heard that some of these Bitcoin miners aren't performing exactly as you have on this chart relative to the price of Bitcoin, which, you know, some can make the argument that the gold miners are doing this, the same underperformance. But we'll get to a comparison 
in a little bit of the gold mining industry versus the Bitcoin miners. But, you know, this idea that these companies can't fund growth or capex based on borrowing money at, you know, five and a quarter percent. Not to mention that they can't even, let's say, have access to that capital if they wanted it, but they're doing it by, you know, really destroying shareholder value over time. I, I couldn't agree more because we see it in spades here. Now, yes, the gold miners and silver miners are in the same way, but that happened to them due to the, the U.S. government, the U.S. Treasury and central banks issuing collateral or treasuries at zero cost. Mm -hmm. And so that really hit inflation in the gold and silver mining industry. It was the, it was the U.S. Treasury and the central banks propping up the markets after the pandemic shutdown that put massive inflation into the gold mining industry. The difference is the Bitcoin mining industry did it to itself. It did it by shared dilution. So uh, we could see in November 2021, uh, when Bitcoin hit 65,000, Marathon was 70. Uh, it was $70 a share. At $62, it's now in the 17 range. So th th this is investors, this is the shared dilution that's mm -hmm. taking place over that period. And it's much worse for Riot because Riot did 2.4 billion. And Back when it peaked in the beginning of 2021, it was $60 a share. Now it's in the $9 range. It's lost six times its value. And I think that's going to continue. Uh, and so this, this is the problem when you use a shareholder to fund business, especially one that has 90% capital destruction in two years. Now, this is what I want to get to. What does all this depreciation mean? Again, all depreciation means is destruction in value of the asset. Well, this is the Bitcoin miner. So we, I call it 75% first year. So people tell me, Steve, it only costs half the amount to produce a Bitcoin. Well, if we look at this chart of Marathon, this is the first quarter, their mining revenues were 144. This isn't this isn't uh, thousands of dollars. It was 144.4 million. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the cost of the mining down here, it's 71.2. Well, look at it. it's half the cost of, of the value of the Bitcoin. But mm -hmm. that's just one part. Of, that's a small part of it. They also did some hosting, but let's they put depreciation, Tom, of 78 million. If we look at their numbers. 168.2 million in cost were higher than the total revenues. They didn't make any money. They didn't make any money selling, uh, producing Bitcoin. But it's worse than that because the general and administration costs are not included in that cost, and they should be. So what I've done is I said that this depreciation is too low. Again, this is my analysis. I believe the depreciation is d more than double. It's 150 million. So when you add up the mining, the hosting, the depreciation, and you add the general and administrative cost, the total is $313 million. It's double what the revenues were. Mm -hmm. It's double what... The, now, you can cut back some of the general and administrative, but they're not including the massive depreciation. You see, an income statement doesn't include the massive depreciation and the capital that has to be spent. And they are seriously underreporting the depreciation. So this, this is the problem. This is the problem, Tom. Now, I'm going to go to this quickly. I'll get to the next chart, which shows you. Now, Marathon's got 240,000 Bitcoin miners. Riot is going to build up to 265. That's all I wanted to show you. They want to build up to 265. So. If Marathon and Riot have 500,000 Bitcoin mining fleet, I'm going to show you the massive depreciation. And people can debate me, but according to the best estimates I found, it's about $4,000 plus or minus for a Bitcoin miner. Again, people can debate me, but that's what it is. 500,000 Bitcoin miners times 4,000 is 2 billion. Well, guess what? According to the data, 75% depreciation first year those Bitcoin miners have lost 1.5 billion in the first year. 
another 300 million in a second, 1.8 billion is gone. So when they build up to that level, Tom, they've got to constantly replace those 500,000 Bitcoin miners. This is what the industry isn't really, and I think they're going to be hitting a brick wall. The only thing that can save them, the only thing that can save them is a $150,000, $200,000 Bitcoin price. That's the only thing that's going to save them. If they don't get a, a, a obnoxious increase in the Bitcoin price, they're going to be in serious trouble trying to maintain this system. But we're talking about just these two miners, right? That's the economics of these big guys over this scale of I don't know if we want to call that a scale of economy, but over the way that these business plans are laid out, right? This isn't necessarily representative of all Bitcoin miners. I believe it is. Uh, I was looking Sorry, at all, all I, Bitcoin mining operations. Okay. Let's, let's put it this way. There's probably some gold miners out there. Luckily, for some reason, producing gold at really maybe $1,000 an ounce, maybe 1000 maybe 900 There could be a few. What, that's correct. But if you look at the major ones, it's 1700 an ounce total cost, 1700 Some are more. Some mines, they're all in sustaining costs to 2000 They're losing money. Well, they, they're not losing money now. But so, yes, there is always a range, but that's not the real production. That's not, these guys are producing most of the Bitcoin, the big players are. So while there are Bitcoin operations that are, are doing it, they're figuring out ways to do it cheaper. You cannot change the inherent depreciation of a Bitcoin miner. These things don't last 15, 20 years. They last three, maybe four, just like a server, just like a server, a computer server that in these data centers. That's the problem with Bitcoin miners. So you can't really change that fundamental. And I think this is the problem with, with these companies trying to ramp up and trying to steal more of the slice. They're hitting this massive capital destruction, massive depreciation. And so now I will tell you this quickly. Riot says, and we're going to hold them to it, that they've got some Bitcoin and they've saved Marathon and Riot have not been selling some of their Bitcoin. They've been stocking it up. And if they get higher prices, well, good for them. So what they're saying is by 2025, they don't need to do any more share dilution. So let's let's keep them to that. Let because they did 353 million first quarter uh, already this year. So they're saying in the next seven quarters, they won't need that. They can fund all their growth. We'll, we'll wait and see if that's true. But this is the chart. I kind of puts it all together because I always like to go back to gold and silver because they really are the best quality collateral because even though it costs a lot of money and energy to produce gold and silver, you've got the gold and silver there above ground. And gold does not decay or rot. Bitcoin, according to 2022 data, uses about, it's ranked half in the United States. It, it consumes more electricity than the lower half of the 25 states. It consumes more than Colorado, Oregon, and, and Iowa. Gold, and this is just in the United States. This is just the 38% of Bitcoins produced in the United States. Gold that was produced in the United States, Tom, was five and a half million ounces. 10 billion worth of that five and a half, uh, million, uh, bill, uh, five and a half million ounces. It was five times less energy. Bitcoin that year was about 3.7 billion Bitcoin produced, and it consumed five times more energy. I just, that to me, gold, even though it's very energy, it, it uses a lot of energy and capital. Gold to me is the better deal than the Bitcoin mining industry. Just to reiterate that, does that gold statistic include all of the diesel and you know petroleum products that go into the mining trucks to get that out of the ground? Yeah, you'll notice the Bitcoin miners, it's mostly electricity. Uh, but if you look at the gold production, it's a total energy. It's 13 terawatts of energy, electricity, petroleum, natural gas. What the, like Barrick and Nuant, what they do is they show in their sustainability reports, they show you about how much uh, energy, total energy, it mm -hmm. takes to produce 
an ounce of gold. I take that number and I multiply it by how many how much gold was produced. So it's it's a pretty good average. Mm -hmm. So yes, it does include petroleum, it does include natural gas, it does include electricity. It it it, it includes all energy. So that just goes to show you how much more energy it takes to produce bitcoin and i think i think in the future i think when we get into problems with uh, with energy production we start getting in peaking of production of energy in the united states i think the the bitcoin miners are going to get into trouble i think states and the federal government are going to crack down because it's 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 really wasteful it's really wasteful uh about one and a half two percent of all electricity right now in the united states is consumed by bitcoin miners and of course, I think we talked about this a little bit before we hit record here today, but you know, when we think of that total production chain from mining the materials that goes into these Bitcoin miners to the amount of energy that goes into making the silicon chips, and then the amount of energy needed to upkeep that entire ecosystem and actually transact with it, you know, we're actually talking about quite a bit of energy in general and materials and as far as i know those materials aren't that recyclable at the end of the life of that miner am i wrong no you're not wrong and i guess the difference is i have to admit the gold mining industry consumes tires and trucks mm -hmm. and, and 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 limes you know lime and they, they just consume a massive amount of energy and, and and materials and equipment just to grind out gold so it, it's kind of similar mm -hmm. bitcoin mining the difference is and this is important for your listeners to understand the depreciation for barrick and newmont is 18 percent a year 18 percent. i mean that's kind of high for, for Bitcoin their, miners for their entire equipment fleet, right? Yeah, if we if we take if we take the depreciation, um, the capital, it's it's also I I look at what they spend in capital, mm -hmm. and what they what they write off in depreciation. Let's say Barrick writes off two uh, two billion in depreciation. They're spending roughly two billion in capital to sustain these operations. And that's how it kind of works. That's how it should work. If their revenue is somewhere in 11 billion, you divide the depreciation or the capital into the revenues. Mm -hmm. And it's about 18%. The Bitcoin mining industry, unfortunately, the Bitcoin miner, the way it's designed, it's, 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 dev it's devouring itself at 75% first year 90 percent second year so the gold mining depreciation is much slower it's it's like it's it's got a five year if you figure 18 20 percent in, in you know in five years that's 100 percent. the bitcoin miner it's 90 percent in two years so what's happening technology isn't better just consumes a massive amount of energy that's that's really what technology is people think technology is more efficient i keep trying to say it it isn't it, you just don't see all the energy it's devouring as well as materials. So this is the, the, the inherent difference. And unfortunately, the top public Bitcoin miners have kind of misled investors and even the industry into believing what they're doing is sustainable. And it isn't sustainable without destroying shareholder value. And I don't know how much longer shareholders are going to continue to invest in these miners, especially if the Bitcoin price does not take off. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, if we're thinking about this, let's say return on megawatt used or, you know, I, I don't know what proper metric that would be. You know, it, it seems like a pretty lopsided argument and analysis here. Yeah. And people think I'm not anti Bitcoin. If people want to invest in Bitcoin, because there's a lot of people who are very staunch investors of Bitcoin. And there's some big people like Max Kaiser. I, I, I don't get into debates and throwing names around and, and saying gold is bad, Bitcoin is good, or Bitcoin's bad and gold is good. It, it's less to do with, with, you know, putting a label and it's more to do with understanding the sustainability of this very high complex technology in a future that we're going to get in trouble with energy. So my simple thing is, Tom, and it 
the technology takes a massive amount of energy and we're going to get into energy peak, energy shortages, then technology is going to get into trouble. So I, I think the, the, the simple thing is to keep it simple, stupid. And that's why I'm a big believer in the physical metals because they're there. And, and they remain there, even though we can come up with ways of you don't have to send gold across the country or across the continent. It's expensive to do that. Gold weighs a lot, especially silver. You don't have to do the Bitcoin. People tell me, well, Steve, you can just send Bitcoin very quickly into another country. That's true. I get that. You don't need to be sending large amounts of weight, but you don't really need to do that either. If you want to transact and keep the gold in one place or silver in one place, the, the issue going forward with, with the with Bitcoin and and the data centers, Tom, I'm not only concerned about the, the sustainability of the Bitcoin mining industry, I'm concerned about the sustainability of the data centers that are becoming huge consumers of power and will continue to be. So the, the, these they kind of run hand in hand, Tom. Well, I think you and I have you know, loosely touched on this idea of data centers and that depreciation as well before, but, you know, always coming back to this idea of counterparty risk, I don't think we ever really want to leave a whole bunch of gold or a bunch of value in somebody else's name just based on a lease or, you know, rehypothecating it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's kind of down the line, but I think the general point of not needing necessarily a ton more energy to upkeep the value of gold versus the value of Bitcoin and being able to transact Bitcoin without having to pour a bunch more energy into it. If we are going to end up facing energy shortages, you know, really doesn't seem like an efficient use of the scarce product, which everybody needs to live. Well, I agree. And maybe I can stop sharing right here. Um, you bring up an excellent point because this is comes down to my foundation, my analysis. Mm -hmm. The gold and silver, the energy and all the capital and all the labor that went into it, that value is locked in there. Mm -hmm. In a Bitcoin, it is locked in there on the ledger because it was mined took a lot of energy to get there and the price of it is gone up and it's there the thing is you continue you need to have continued uh burning of energy a lot of energy just to keep that system going too you don't need that with gold and silver they're just lying there they're in a vault they're in your home they're at a dealer in jewelry whatever a central bank it's there held it doesn't need any special technology to, to maintain it. So th that's why I call gold the highest co quality collateral in the world. The market doesn't understand that yet. They, they're confused. They think treasuries are. They're not. Um, and so Bitcoin, this is the problem with Bitcoin going forward. It's heading into a future of energy scarcity and the ability to continue burning all this energy to keep that system going is going to get into trouble. I agree with you. So Steve, how do these margins and, you know, we kind of touched a little bit upon the depreciation idea, but how does this compare to the gold mining industry costs versus revenue wise, or even dilution wise for some established miners? Well, if the gold miners had a 75% depreciation first year, they, they would, they would be in the same boat as the Bitcoin miners. They really would be. But because their depreciation is 18% and they have their costs right now at 2300 my break even for the, 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 the gold miners is about 17, 1750. Mm -hmm. So at 23 or 2350, they're making five, six hundred dollars an ounce, including the depreciation, the capital destruction. Mm -hmm. The Bitcoin miners are not. They're, they're not making that. And so uh, th this is the inherent difference. Uh, and so, but the problem with the with the gold miners for them to 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 see, I think their stock prices really increase, which I think they will in the future. We need to see twenty five, twenty six, three thousand gold with 
the price to produce gold still at seventeen, eighteen hundred dollars, maybe nineteen. Just you would need expansion. to you would need to see a significant margin expansion, just like they had in two thousand twenty and twenty one. See, I, I have a chart for for my subscribers. You should see the top five or top six um, free cash flow from the top gold miners. There was tremendous uh, free cash flow in twenty and twenty one. It's it's collapsed, and it's even worse in the first quarter. So this is the problem. They're still struggling to, um, uh, but they they are making money. They're just not making as much money as they were in twenty and twenty one. And that's due, we can thank the central banks for that. Let me, let me just say this. And I've said this many times on Twitter. You can't, the gold and silver mining industry is trying to compete with central banks that are printing trillions of bonds and treasuries, and it costs them zero to do that. Mm -hmm. There is a broker fee that they use to sell these to the public or to corporations or to central banks. There is a fee, and then they have to pay an interest on that. But to, to the United States sold 2.4 trillion of new treasuries. There was ba basically zero cost. The gold miners, it was 85% cost. And the silver miners, it's 95% cost. So that's the difference. And at some point in time, Tom, the US treasuries and, and, and the central bank bonds are gonna get into trouble because there's too many of them. They, they cannot be settled. And this is when I see the gold miners and the precious metals re-emerging as a higher quality collateral and assets and money. If you and I have gone over before this idea of AISC or all in sustaining cost, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for gold miners, you have a different way of looking at this metric that takes into account a couple more of these costs. So can you run us through that again to understand that picture properly, please? Well, let me do this. The, the gold mining industry has done themselves a disservice. They're trying to say the all in sustaining cost, let's say for Barrick, I think it was like 1475 or something in the first quarter. But you know, the my cost for Barrick was much higher. It was like 1750, 1760. Mm -hmm. That I go by the adjusted net income. What Barrick is doing is saying we're only going to use sustainable capital to get that figure. We're only going to show how much sustainable capital. The problem is they've been adding, they've been having expansionary or developmental capital for a decade. It's in the billions, but Barrick's production is declining. Mm -hmm. It was 7 million ounces a year. Now it's, it's less than four. If they were actually doing a developmental and expansionary capital, they should be growing their production. They're not. They're, it, it, so the gold mining industry to underreport their true cost is they're, they're calling it sustainable capital mm -hmm. and they're excluding developmental. Some companies like Agnico, they are, they are expanding production, but a lot of them now are not. They're maintaining or declining. And so this is one of the, one of the major factors that is not considered is that they're underreporting they're all in sustaining costs because the sustaining cost isn't sustaining. And lastly, Pan American Silver, I just looked at their depreciation, was double what their capital expenditure was mm -hmm. for the first quarter. It was like 120 million in depreciation. They only did 75 million in, uh, in capital expenditure. So the problem is they're not spending enough money. They're underreporting, they're not spending enough capital. So they're underreporting. They're, depre they're overreporting their depreciation. And so I don't mean to be too confusing, but that's the problem, Tom. Are they all in sustaining costs? Guess what, folks? It's not sustaining. So, Steve, you know, one of the, let's say, the arguments for why the gold miners haven't caught as much fire and or even gold is that Bitcoin is taking away a lot of this capital that would have otherwise come into the gold space. How do you view that argument in light of this research? Well, you have four, let's say, uh, all the money that's gone into the Bitcoin miners, into the shares, and they've been diluted, right? So the shareholders are holding the bag. Some institutions own these, these miners, 
But so a lot of the, the money that could have went into gold miners and silver miners went into Bitcoin miners. Mm -hmm. And it, yes, Bitcoin, gold and silver miners have underperformed, but nothing like the Bitcoin miners. Yeah, I did a chart showing how much gold went into the, according to the, uh, the uh, World Gold Council, it was 12.1 billion that went into, not the World Gold Council, it's gold, but according to uh, one of the crypto websites, about 12.1 billion went into the top Bitcoin ETFs in the first quarter, mm -hmm. first quarter. So that's when we saw Bitcoin take off. Well, central banks were about 14 billion. So you could see, even though central banks have been buying a lot of gold, a lot of money went into Bitcoin. And that's just in the ETFs. There's been probably more money went into Bitcoin itself. So yeah, there's a lot of money moving into Bitcoin and it will continue to do that if the price goes up. But when the price started to decline a week or two ago, we started seeing net outflows mm -hmm. in the ETFs uh, because that's the way ETFs are supposed to work. So it's going to be very interesting to see if investors continue to, to plow into Bitcoin. Uh, uh, again, I'm not saying right now that the Bitcoin mining industry is bad for Bitcoin. It's bad for the Bitcoin mining industry, but in the mid to longer term, it's probably not going to be good for the, for the Bitcoin itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're going to have to find a way of being able to sustainably, you know, however anybody wants to feel about that word, but actually be able to sustainably run that business, actually operate that business without diluting shareholders all to hell like that. Right. And there's a lot more to it. They call it if there's not enough Bitcoin miners to do the Bitcoin mining, as well as do the transactions. <clears throat> because they have to do the transactions, trading and transactions. If it gets too low, it, 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 there's a problem with the security protocol. And that's another thing. So if there's enough Bitcoin miners, that security protocol is fine. If it gets to a certain level, that's when it gets into trouble. So uh, again, I know enough to, about that to be dangerous. But when you look at the Bitcoin mining industry, it is just the way it is designed now. It's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it's, of course, with something that is new and has the ability to change over time, it's obviously going to change over time. But it'll be interesting to see how the Bitcoin industry is able to make those adaptations. Yeah, because if, like I mentioned, if, if uh, Marathon and Riot, and there's others, there's Clean Spark, there's others. If they get up to a half a million Bitcoin miners, you saw what it is going to take to just replace that. Mm -hmm. Every two years, they got to replace that. So it's one thing building up, but when you get there and you've got to maintain that number, you're going to need one and a half billion. Of, you've got to replace that in the first year mm -hmm. at some point. If you want to maintain 500,000 Bitcoin miners, that's the inherent nature of a Bitcoin miner. So that's the cost. So it's not just electricity. The electricity is actually the smaller part of the, the real cost of big mining Bitcoin. The larger cost is the Bitcoin miner itself. And so I think when in the future, electricity prices are going to really go through the roof and it's going to be a double whammy mm -hmm. for the Bitcoin mining industry. Steve, you mentioned the ETFs there and about this kind of inflows and outflows. How do you see the inflows and outflows in the West versus the East right now in the gold ETFs? You know, I, I noticed that you recently did a, a story on this about how much gold has flowed into Chinese gold ETFs. So is there any link to gold leaving these Western ETFs and going East into these Chinese gold ETFs? Yeah, it, you know, Asia and China does not have a lot of gold in ETFs. They, they buy gold and they hold gold either in their home or in a vault. So it was interesting to see in a short period of time that the Chinese ETFs, and this is according to uh, uh, Gold Charts or Us, uh, uh, it increased a billion dollars in a very short period of time. And what we've noticed in the West, it's continued to see net outflows. That's been going on for several years now. It's central banks that have been buying gold, 
And it's mostly Eastern and Asian central bank and as well as Middle Eastern central banks. So it's not the West buying gold. The West was selling gold up until 2009. That's where all the gold sales were happening in the world. It's mostly Western gold sales. And then it flipped and it was net buying in 2010. And most of that gold was going China, Russia, these Asian countries, and, and uh, also Middle East. And so, yes, there is the, the crazy dynamic for some reason. It seems as if the West has been fooled by the, the, the U.S. Treasury and the bond markets. They're moving into treasuries and money market funds, money market you know accounts. And the, the, due to the problems with the currencies, in Japan and in China, they're moving more into gold. So we are we definitely see that 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 change, and I think that's just going to get worse over time. So, but, but at some point, at some point, West are going to start having to buy gold again. They're, they're not. It's kind of amnesia, it, you know. They but it's like the I call it the the moth is the moth is going up to the great flame in the sky. And that's the treasury. That's the high interest rate. That's the money market account. Th that's what's pulling the West. It's kind of like a child, you know, the Pied Piper. But it's, at some point in time, they're going to have to wake up and get back into gold, get it back into real assets, because those financial assets are more of a lore. They're going to get burned out. So are they going to print more dollars? to be able to buy gold again when they figure that out, Steve? Uh, when you say they're going to print more dollars to... Well, you said, uh, you said to, that the West is going to figure that out, that they're going they're going to have to turn around and try to buy gold again. So, Oh, so I see what you're saying. What are they going to buy that gold with if they have well, worthless dollars at that point? Well, the, yeah, the West has a lot of dollars, right? The Western investors, Western countries have a lot of have a lot of dollars, mm -hmm. and so the thing is, we don't need to print more. There's a lot there. There's there's trillions there, and there's there's twenty seven trillion now in outstanding U.S. Treasuries. Mm -hmm. So that can be liquidated, and they could buy gold. And that can get very interesting when that when that really hits. So I think what I'm trying to say is. As the U.S. Treasury continues to print more treasuries, and that's really the money supply, Tom, when you look at the cumulative deficits in the United States, it matches the M2 money supply. Mm -hmm. So we're funding deficits by printing treasuries, the market's absorbing those treasuries, and that's becoming the money supply. And it's also very inflationary. That, and that's going to continue. That, that's going to continue. And at some point in time, when you get into trouble with energy, Tom, it's going to be very difficult to sustain the U.S. Treasury market because now I heard that they're going to start buying U.S. Treasuries. The U.S. Treasury said they're going to start buying U.S. Treasuries. And so it's going to be like the Bitcoin mining industry. You know, they, you know, right now they're in trouble. At some point in time, the U.S. Treasury is going to get into trouble. It's not going to be sustainable, just like the Bitcoin mining industry is not going to be sustainable. It's just much bigger. It's 27 trillion and outstanding treasuries. It's a much bigger problem. Excellent, Steve. Well, you know, I think that's yeah, covered a lot. Know, a good a good analysis and a good a good uh bunch of bunch of topics for our listeners to think about today. You know, do you want to leave our listeners with anything else to ponder before we do wrap up here? Yeah. Tom, I, I was very big into precious metals because I knew all the money printing and, and the fiat money, uh, the debt, the basement and all that. But it wasn't until I understood energy why I'm a big believer in physical metals and physical assets. Mm -hmm. And so it's and a lot of people, either they look at energy, they look at Bitcoin mining or Bitcoin, they look at gold and silver they look at the real estate market. They're very they, they're very focused. I, I look how they're all inner works, inter, interlocks. And so I see things much differently. And so the energy problems that I see coming, the market does not really understand. Mm -hmm. And so what, I'm tr what I try to, to educate people is why the metals, gold and silver, are, are, are really going to be the go-to asset compared to a lot of finance and even Bitcoin. And so at the, at the SRS Rock Report, I continue to update what's happening with energy. I just did a shale gas update in the United States where I think it's going to peak because mm -hmm. it's very important. 
because we're exporting a lot of gas now to Europe and elsewhere. So I think it's very important for people to really open their minds, if they haven't, to understand what's happening with energy, because that's why you invest. You invest in things because you understand what's happening with energy. And a lot of people, most people, most financial economists don't do that. They, they, they exclude energy in their analysis. Excellent. So if anybody wants to find out more about that, that's all available at srsrockoreport.com. And of course, Steve's an excellent follow on Twitter as well, at srsrockoreport. Yeah, I'm busy on there too. Yeah. And Tom, appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.